So good morning. It's really a pleasure to um, to give this talk. Um, uh, Dr. Cusimano asked me to talk about how we deal with um, intracardiac extension of abdominal and retroperitoneal tumors, and specifically uh, hepatic tumors. Although I'm going to talk about hepatic cable, adrenal, renal, um, really anything that pops into the cava goes through the liver and basal liver doesn't, then goes into the goes into the heart. This is in broad terms what I'm going to be dealing with. I'd like to give a couple of case examples and a couple of um, examples of the approaches we take with this. Um, really, I think that that's probably the heart of all of this. I'm gonna focus on in situ cold perfusion of the liver and cable clamping uh, because those are the cases in, in my world anyway that have cardiac extension. And usually when you're dealing with cardiac extension of an hepatic or a tumor in the cava, you're, you're inevitably dealing with the liver I'm going to give some general pointers, uh, not many, just two slides, but general pointers about how to approach these kind of cases. Um, I'd like to talk about how we assess what's resectable because I think that's um, the heart of all of this. You know, when should you, when can you resect things? It's not, these are um, specialized tumors that generally are dealt with in specialized areas, specialized centers. Uh, there aren't huge numbers of any of these. So, um, Ideally, you want a method where you can bring a lot of people together in, in one room, virtual or not, and then quickly go into conclusions. So let me just talk about some case examples of hepatic and retroperitoneal tumors that uh, require um, uh, dealing with an intracardiac component. So this is um, a typical sort of case that we would deal with here. Uh, this is a 60-year-old woman who presented with hepatocellular cancer. She had a normal liver but she had this huge hepatocellular cancer that was invading sort of the, involving this sort of the top half of the right lobe of the liver. Not infrequently with these things, obviously I have a selection bias, but not infrequently these things, they'll grow into the um, hepatic vein, they'll grow up the cava and then they'll pop into, pop into the heart, often just the lower part of the right atrium, but if they keep growing, they, they can be largely asymptomatic with time and they can get quite large. So in this case, I'm just going to pause this for a sec. So in, in this case, you can see that what you're dealing with is a case where you have to deal with the liver, the cava, and then the cardiac component of the, um, of the extension. Um, so inevitably, that means you're going to be clamping the cava below and above. Uh, and often, you're clamping the, the clamp in this, on this figures by right, you're actually clamping the lower atrium. And as soon as you do that, there are a couple of things you have to do. One is you have to shut flow down to the heart. So you've got to clamp, sorry, shut flow down to the liver. So you've got to clamp the liver as well. And when you start doing that, of course, the liver, although it's very tolerant, it's starting to die, it's ischemic. And you have to assess whether or not the patient will tolerate the cable clamping. And if they don't, then you're faced with a situation of, well, can I fluid load them? Can I give them enough inotropes to get them through the clamp phase? Or do I need to institute some kind of bypass? And I'm going to argue that the Probably the best bypass you can do for this is a vena vena bypass. Um, that's our go-to move for these sort of things. Um, because if you institute cardiac bypass and you give a ton of anticoagulation and anticoagulation, <clears throat> or at least massive anticoagulation in the face of a liver section is, is not a good thing. So in this case, um, they didn't tolerate the clamp. So we've instituted a vena vena bypass, the, the cava to the right IJ, clamped um, the cava below and above, clamped the liver. And the idea is it will go through the liver, take the left hepatic vein, flush the liver with cold preservation solution. When we do that, we, the liver is preserved basically. And then we could remove the specimen and then rebuild the cava and sew the left hepatic vein onto the side of the cable graft. And you can do that in a safe manner. The whole idea with these cases is turning, <clears throat> turning um, a complicated situation into a reasonably straightforward one. Here's another example um, uh, of a case that requires um, planning, but just to demonstrate that often with these cases, the planning doesn't work out as you might expect. So this is a lady uh, in her 50s who presented actually with peripheral edema. She presented with peripheral edema because she had the cable tumor, a Lymar sarcoma that had started, they often start just at the junction of the cava and the right renal vein, and then it had grown up uh, through the liver and it popped into the lower part of the heart. So this is an example of it 
there's the inferior border of the, of the tumor. And you can see how the cave is expanded. You can see actually the tumor growing into the right hepatic vein and then popping up into the lower part of the heart. So our plan with this was to do much, like I showed you the last case, was to do a liver resection and evolve the cava, but in this case also took out the kidney, then flush the liver so that it's preserved um, with the atrium clamp and, and the cava clamp like before, and then reconstruct the cava and sew the hepatic vein back on. That was our plan anyway. In this case, we'd be reimplanting the middle of the left hepatic vein. The problem was that when we started this case, the right hepatic vein we knew was clotted. Um, this is the, the TE showing the occluded right hepatic vein. What we didn't expect is that in two weeks that it took us to get the patient to the OR, the middle hepatic vein and the left hepatic vein had clotted as well. So now we had this acute bud carry syndrome and we had this sort of nasty situation where we had to think either about abandoning the whole thing or moving to an ex vivo approach where you take the whole specimen out um, and do everything on the back bench and hope that you can find enough uh, acute clot that you can pull it out and free up the middle and left hepatic vein, um, open them up enough that you can then sew them back into a, a graft. In the end, that's what we went with. And so this is on the back bench. That's the, this is us removing some of the tumor from the divided middle and left hepatic vein. opening up in that case, the middle vein. So that's a specimen in itself that you can see the tumor expanding the cava. And then on the back bench, we can divide the liver. That's the cable graft, the temporary port cable shunt. This is us making a diamond shaped opening in the graft. That cable graft is sent from the lower part of the atrium to the um, renal aspect of the cava. This is the post and the pre-TEE with the sarcoma sitting atrium free and the, sarcoma, and the atrium being free of tumor afterwards. So I, I'm showing that because it points out that um, planning is really important, um, but planning for all eventualities is, is impossible. So you have to be able to dance through these cases and you have to have a wide armamentarium of options um, before you set out on this. No, I just to point out that in the previous case, we had, I'd shown you one with um, um, needing vena vena bypass. This was done without vena vena bypass, just with fluid loading and with appropriate inotropes. And here's an example where uh, you have to have bypass. This is a hepatoma that we did um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, sorry, a couple of months ago. Uh, a large hepatoma starting in the liver that grew into the cava and then grew up into the heart had been there for a long time and there's a huge ball sitting in the in the um, atrium that actually kept popping into the tricuspid and there was no way that was going to slide out um, so we knew we had to um, put this patient on bypass this is an interesting case actually because uh, I put a circle here around a uh, really interesting part of this. You can see there's a tumor in the liver. What it's actually done is it's grown into the bile duct. This this is the bile duct here. So this lady actually presented with jaundice, partly because she had a bud carry because all the hepatic veins were blocked, but also because the bile duct was blocked. So when we put a stent in, that helped, uh, although the bilirubin really never came down to normal. So in this case, um, we plan to do an ex vivo extended right hepatectomy with a sternotomy, midline laparotomy, bilateral horizontal extensions to give you as much exposure as possible. Um, initiated cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, removed the, the liver, the cava, and the lower atrium, reconstructed the cava with a tube made out of bovine pericardium, um, did the liver resection ex vivo, um, and that left us with... Um, in this case, two hepatic veins that were widely separated. So we brought another tube of bovine pericardium and sewed the two hepatic veins onto that, and then brought that tube onto the side of the cable graft. Now, the real advantage of this was that we could, once the once the cable graft was in place, um, RJ could reverse the um, bypass, and then the patient can be there for uh, any length of time because it takes hours to do the ex vivo uh, liver resection, the hepatic vein reconstruction. And then after that, it becomes a, a standard sort of liver transplant with the hepatic artery and the bile duct anastomosis completed. So this is a picture of the specimen um, on the back bench, actually after the after the resection, and you can see how the tumor has expanded the liver itself, and then it's popped into the cava. It's actually invaded the wall of the cava. There's a rim of atrium around here, 
And um, this lady did um, uh, uh, struggle for a while, as you can imagine. That they, once the liver had, de had decongested, if you liked, once it had um, shrunk back to its normal size, the amount of liver that we put back in was just quite small. So we spent about six weeks waiting for the liver to grow back. And then once it grew back to a decent size, we could excavate her and get her home. Hubris. So I'm I'm bringing up this um, case. Uh, RJ actually sent me these pictures last night. Um, I'm bringing up this case because you um, have to put your pride on a back burner with these sort of things. You, the, there are a lot of teaching points that only come with experience here. This is a case that we did shortly after I came on staff in 2006. And it's a cable sarcoma. You can see it expanding the cava here. And it had grown up. Um, past the hepatic veins and into the, into the atrium. And we all thought, well, no biggie. We'll just put the clamps on, open the cava, remove the lower part of the cava and pull the whole thing out of the atrium. And then rebuild the cava with this bovine pericardium graft. Now, if you look closely, you'll actually see that this is the lower part of the atrium and it's actually reconstructed with, with um, bovine pericardium, sorry, this graft is PTFE, this, uh, or sorry, Gore-Tex, and that time I was using Gore-Tex, and this is, uh, but if you look at the lower part of the atrium, you can see it's reconstructed the patch of, of um, bovine pericardium, that's because this thing didn't pull out of the atrium, so then we're left in this situation where we could go, where we went on bypass um, quite precipitously, which is great from a cardiac standpoint, but terrible from a liver standpoint, because now the whole body was cooled except for the liver, which we'd already clamped for the exclusion portion of this, um, which is a bit nauseating. Uh, fortunately, I was with a fellow who pointed out that we could quickly cannulate the portal vein, so we did that and then flush it. But um, just to point out again, that these, these, these cases inevitably are gonna be something of a dance and planning is essential, um, but experience counts and you have, to put your, you have to put your ego on a back burner to get everything through. So now I'm going to talk about in situ cold perfusion of liver and cable clamping. I'm going to talk about that because um, the reasons for doing in situ cold perfusion of the liver for an hepatic tumor not infrequently involve intracardiac extension of a cardiac tumor or a cable tumor or an adrenal tumor or a renal tumor. Because again, anytime you have to replace the cava, you're going to have to clamp the at least the um, liver portion of that, you're going to have to clamp the liver to exclude blood flow to that area. And the same is true of a tumor that comes from liver and goes into the cava and or the hepatic vein and goes up into the, into the heart. So uh, the liver surgery gets tricky when the major vessels you want to keep are involved. So I'm saying this is true for hepatic veins, which is what the bulk of these cases are for, but it's just as true if it goes up in the hepatic vein, it goes up into the heart. Uh, and that's because if you're going to rebuild this, you're going to have to exclude the liver. So you're going to have to clamp the, the inflow to the liver and you're gonna have to clamp the outflow of the liver, whether that's lower atrium or cava. And as soon as you do that, the liver starts to die. The liver is now ischemic. Um, now the liver is actually remarkably tolerant um, to ischemia, to ischemic perfusion injury, but there's a limit to that. And you can probably exclude it for an hour or even longer pretty safely. Um, the question is whether you can predict for sure that you're going to have an hour to exclude it or whether it's going to take longer or whether something, one of those disasters that I showed you before is going to happen and whether you're going to have to dance a bit. And you, it just, when those things happen, it gets very um, stressful. So ideally you want something that takes the stress out of it and gives you as many options as possible. So ideally you want a technique that will maintain liver parenchymal in integrity for as long as possible. So one solution to that is inside your cold perfusion of the liver, which is where you flush the liver in the abdomen and cool it down and that gives you hours really of, of time safety takes the pressure valve right off and really what we're doing here is adopting transplantation techniques for oncology and for oncologic liver resection so the idea is that every step of those cases that i presented before really whether it's ex vivo or whether it's or in situ is analogous to a live donor liver transplant because there's a liver resection phase then there's a preservation phase where you flush the liver, whether it's remaining in situ or whether it's ex vivo, where you're creating a graft in essence. And then there's an implantation phase. And the principles of that 
the principles of cable reconstruction, the principles of maintaining decent outflow for the liver, maintaining decent inflow, those are all transplantation principles. Let me just describe this in a little bit more detail because I think it's important. So in vivo hyperthermic perfusion liver, now what I, I have shown here a um, hepatic vein tumor or tumor at the confluence of the three hepatic veins, but it could just easily be a tumor that's grown into the cava from the liver or a tumor that's grown, growing through the liver in the cava. And the principle of this is you put a, a cannula into the inflow of the liver and, and almost always in the portal veins. That's how we do it. Stick a cannula into the portal vein. Um, and through that cannula, you then flush uh, ice cold preservation solution. And that really quickly cools down the liver. And you, the outflow for that is wherever you're going to reconstruct, whether it's a patagon or the cava. You can pack the liver on ice and that cools it down even more. It gets a, the, the core temperature of a liver down. And once you've got it down below about 25 degrees, um, you're pretty safe for a long period of time. We've taken this out for two hours or more, um, which is really, as I say, stress relieving. And that gives you time to take your time while you're rebuilding the cava, which is important because this upper anastomosis, whether it's to the atrium or to the cava is always awkward. And you really wanna have time so you can position the hepatic vein or whatever else you're re-implanting onto the side of that, onto the side of that graft. <clears throat> now you notice in this, that there are cable clamps. So why am I pointing that out? I'm pointing that out because of a strong memory that I have from, from fellowship. I think it was, I think I was a fellow back in 2003. And one of my now partners, I wasn't actually involved in this, but I was wandering through the OR and one of my partners, and so I watched of course, because you do sort of out of you know, morbid curiosity. One of my partners, um, had this nasty situation where the hepatic vein had ripped during a, a standard liver resection and the vein had ripped and had torn the cava up, up um, under the diaphragm attachments and was going up somewhere near the atrium. Although no one could see it because there was so much blood. So we got one of our <coughs> world famous cardiac surgeons, and I won't say who because there's so many here, but we got one of our cardiac surgeons in. We did a sternotomy. They did a sternotomy and then followed this. Um, strange situation where the um, uh, cardiac guy kept saying, you should never clamp the cava. You should never clamp the cava, which I always found a bit odd because we know we have the largest liver transplant center in, in North America. We clamp the cava all the time, but there's still this feeling that, that you shouldn't clamp the cava short of doing it in the context of a bypass. And the truth is, of course, you can clamp the cava. And with good anesthesia, most patients with good hearts will tolerate it. And if not, again, I'm going to stress this again. If, if, if they don't, then I would consider vena vena bypass before I would cardiac bypass because huge doses of heparin and liver section are just bad. And that points out that anesthesia is really um, front and center for all these cases. The anesthetic considerations um, are central and they differ for each case. Um, so, for instance, if you look at an inside you cold perfusion of the liver or, or any of these cases, there are different phases here. There's the phase prior to clamping, which um, Stuart McCluskey, who, who's a good friend of mine and an excellent uh, anesthetist, both cardiac and liver, made this slide for me. So he's calling it a paleohepatic phase because Stuart is, is, is this far off from being a classical scholar, but he means the pre anapanic phase or the pre clamp phase. And, and during that phase, you know, when you're going through the liver, you want to keep people as dry as possible. So liver isn't congested and you can um, minimize blood loss. But then there's the anaphatic phase, which is when you clamp the liver inflow and you clamp the cava when everything is excluded. That's a totally different phase because there, you know, although you're still trying to keep people dry, you may yet have to fluid load them to some extent. And um, you've instituted a whack load of inotropes to get them through it and or you've instituted a venovena bypass. And then the next phase is when you take the clamps off, which is not small. I mean, of course, um, <clears throat> cardiac surgeons will be very used to taking the clamps off for the heart. Um, we have similar sort of considerations when you take the clamps off and you're now releasing all this acidic fluid from the liver into the circulation because the first thing it hits is the heart, of course. So as, as Stu would say, talk to your anesthetist and prepare. And there are lots of things to do before any of these um, before any of these cases start. And this is another slide that Stu gave me. This is a couple of years ago. This is pre 
this is pre-COVID, so I think I weighed about 60 pounds more than I do now, but this is me smiling into the, smiling into the OR, um, asking Stu why, why it's taking so long, but it's taking so long because he had to put an IVs, because he had an art line in, in the hand, because defib pads, testing, uh, maybe another art line somewhere else, um, central line. So this is a central line in the, in the right IJ, which is where people tend to go. But I would um, generally recommend that if, if you're going to have a combined case with a cardiac tumor, you should, you should put the central line in the left IJ in case you have to go and bypass and need to cannulate the right IJ. For vena vena bypass, I'm talking specifically. The level one warmer, um, and then of course the inotropes. So we um, um, sort of go back and forth, uh, inotropes and other additional medication, we tend to go back and forth on transazemic acid. Um, but certainly in any of these cases, vasopressin is a good thing to consider, um, partly for its vasoconstrictive aspect, but also because it decreases flow to the liver, which will limit blood loss from the liver and levofed. And as Stu would point out, you know, the, the key with these sort of things is um, testing. You know, you're not going to know if someone is going to tolerate a cable clamp until you test it. Um, there's no rush to this. You want to set these things up so that you're not doing this under pressure. So we usually um, test the cable um, early. So we get some sense of whether or not somebody will tolerate cable clamping. Um, go through the liver, as I say, under um, minimal uh, fluid loading conditions, keeping the CVP as low as you can, keeping the urine output as low as you can. And then if they really don't tolerate uh, clamping when you get near the point that you, you're really committed, then um, you know, vena vena bypass is a good option. And what we usually do is put a cannula in the, in the cava, because it's right there, you can just put a maquette, um, curve the maquette straight into it, pop it in, and then one in the, uh, another maquette in the right IJ, <clears throat> and then use an ECMO machine to keep it circulating. And that will get you through a lot. So uh, another slide from Stuart to point out anesthetic considerations that when the clamps are on and the liver is excluded, you're endopathic, basically. Uh, and a good way to monitor how the heart's doing, how everything else is doing is a TEE. Uh, fluid management. So I've been talking about fluid loading, but um, which is maybe the surgical approach to it. You know, keep everyone dry up to the point you need to put the clamps on, when you put the clamps on, the fluid load. Stuart has a more nuanced, subtle approach to that. He watches the urine output and tries to keep the fluid um, loading as low as possible because when you take the clamps off, it's also it's going to go in the circulation, the liver's going to get congested, which is bad. So he aims to keep people as dry as possible. Watches the coagulation um, carefully with rotems, routine rotems, and um, asks a lot, you know, how the patient is doing from a coagulation standpoint. Um, and inotropes, as I say, um, generally we tend to focus on vasopressin and levofed. And again, if these things aren't tolerated, if you can't get somebody through this, then vena vena bypass is a good thing to consider before you put somebody on cardiac bypass. Before you clamp, we always um, anticoagulate. Uh, if it's just a cable reconstruction and a, and a, a um, uh, atrial, lower atrial reconstruction, where, where it's, we may or may not have done a sternotomy, but we're just looking at the lower, lower atrium, then we don't do um, an ACT. Um, I just give 5,000 or thereabouts uh, units of, of heparin because I'm, I'm not trying to over anticoagulate because I really want to limit that for the liver. Um, but if you do go on bypass, of course, you do have to do an ACT. And of course, if you go into, sorry, if you have to go on vena vena bypass, then we do aim for a initial ACT of about 300. And if you have to go on cardiac bypass, then of course you all know that much better than I. Just a point, I was saying that, you know, the, the considerations when you remove the clamps from the liver, there are considerations, just there are considerations when you remove the clamps from, from the heart and when you, when you reverse that bypass. Um, the principal one being that, you know, whatever is built up in the liver is going to hit the heart and it's going to hit the systemic circulation. It's going to hit the heart first. And that's going to be a combination of cold preservation uh, solution if you haven't flushed the liver properly, whatever acid and other you know, garbage is sitting in the liver. And it can definitely, definitely hit the heart and the systemic um, circulation pretty hard. So um, rather than just releasing the clamps quickly, usually we'll release the portal vein clamp especially slowly and watch the temperature on the 
on the PA line just to keep it from going up too fast. It's a it's a transplant. It's actually a living donor transplant trick, but it works especially well for these kind of for these kind of cases. And to follow up on all this, so we 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 tend to think of surgery as surgeons, but you know anesthesia is just as important and truthfully it's not just anesthesia i mean surgery is a team in these kind of cases in particular point out that this is really a team approach and if you're going to get through it then you need a good team it's not just anesthesia you know maybe the anesthetist and the fellow but it's the or nurses scrub circulating maybe a few trainees residents fellows x-ray staff porters and then of course everyone else you know all the icu staff and everyone who, who's involved in the post-operative care so it's a it's a large team that gets these people through and that's an important consideration because everyone's going to be looking at these cases slightly differently. So I, I, I use this slide a lot because one of the things I do is, or one of my hobbies, if you like, or passions, depending how you look at it, is um, video-based surgical education. And all of that has to do with interpretation. How do you interpret an image or how do you interpret a case? So this is an example of a bunch of people staring at a screen prior to a case the screen has a CT on it of the case that we're going to do. But, you know, everyone in that room, although they're staring at the same picture, is going to be interpreting it differently. You know, there's the staff involved, the fellow, senior resident, junior resident, staff radiologist, someone else. You know, and all those people are going to be looking at that picture and they're all going to see something totally different. The same is true of these sort of cases that I'm talking about, that we're talking about, of the paddock cable cases that are starting the abdomen going up into the heart. Everyone has a different conception of, first of all, what that means, second of all, what the issues are, and third of what you're gonna do. You know, so really ideally what you'd like to do is get everyone on the same page. And one way to do that is to make a page, is to create a script. And this is something we've been doing for the last number of years. And um, it basically is just me or whoever's doing the case sitting down and saying, okay, this is what we need. Here's all the equipment that we need. Here are some things that I think anesthesia should think about. And then here is a step-by-step -step description of the case, at least as I'm visualizing it. And it's a very useful exercise because it lets you think about what could go wrong. It lets you think about who you would need in that room if it does go wrong. It uh, allows you to work your way through the whole thing. And then you give that script to everyone else in the room, you know, the nurses, the anesthetists, fellows, residents, uh, everyone. And then everyone is now much closer together when it comes to the interpretation of what is going to happen in the case. And it really changes, changes the whole case. We actually, I started doing this when we created the Toronto Video Atlas of Surgery because we were trying to think of ways that we could efficiently record films but we you know which is telling a story and so you wanted to be able to make sure that you captured that story but it's actually a really useful tool for getting the whole team on the same page about a complicated case and it works you know this is a this is a slide i've used a lot about a 24-hour case that we had you know, we said it was going to take 24 hours it took 24 hours it was 44 steps we went through all of them in sequence um actually in order which is unusual and it worked you know and it got it got everyone everyone through it and the patient through it and it was as efficient as possible i think the single most important step is usually the last step step 44 which is now we have in every script step 44 is when you close and then you celebrate So how do these people do? How do these cases do? How uh, do people with an insight to cold perfusion that liver and or cardiac extension and or bypass actually do? Because these are, these are big cases. There aren't that many of them done around the world. There have been a few uh, reviews done, but the, even when you pull everyone together, uh, you're looking at you know, 200, 300 cases. Um, so it's a, if you want to become an expert in something, I would say, the trainees this is not a bad thing to go an expert because you only have to do a handful of cases and or read about them and there you are you're, you're an expert there just aren't that many that are done uh in toronto we reviewed our um, experience recently if you look from 2006 to 2018 into over 12 year span we had 56 cases 52 were in situ four x vivo liver sections 
with total vascular series and liver vascular reconstruction, whether it's portal vein, hepatic artery, cava, hepatic veins, they all had hepatic, they all had vascular reconstruction of some form. A good fraction of them, probably about a quarter, had an intracardiac extension, which is the reason that we had to do this in the first place. Had to do the in situ, I mean. What are these cases? Um, about a third are metastatic colon cancer. Um, about a quarter are intrahepatic um, cholangiocarcinomas. The rest are things like sarcomas, hepatomas, and adrenal cancers, or, um, I mean, I, for the most part, these are not, in fact, none of these I don't think are, no, that's wrong. There are, there are two, one renal cell cancer. And I think there's another lecture talking about renal cells and such to go off into the heart, which is a different approach by and large than what I'm talking about. Um, metastatic colon cancer can grow into a vein, can grow around a vein, can go into the heart, but for the most part, the ones that have intracardiac extension are things like cholangiocarcinomas, sarcomas, and hepatoma, as I've shown you before. Um, they're long cases, 10 hours or so. Um, usually you're clamping the liver for about an hour. Um, it ranges though, obviously, from half an hour to two or two and a half. Um, they're lengthy. You can expect blood loss, 3.7 units, or sorry, liters or general, 6.3 units transfused you know, on average. Um, and there's a bit of a learning curve. So if you look at it from, you know, how we did in the first half and how you do in the, in the next half, um, people, as the experience grows in the center, not just in you know, surgical hands, the stay in the ICU shortens, the stay in the step down shortens, and the um, hospital stays tends to tends to shorten as well. Mortality, five of 43 for the patients we had long-term follow-up. This is in 2006, 2016, so about 12% overall, which is, which is significant, obviously, in these days of limiting, limiting mortality. And they're morbid, you know, grade, having grade three or higher about 51%. Um, you can, so you can expect something is likely to go wrong postoperatively in general. I mean, should, it's just the nature of the beast with these, and, and the mortality is real. And generally, the mortality with these um, reflects the liver more than anything else. I mean, if, if the liver kicks in and does well, then generally the, the patient will kick in and do well. But if the liver doesn't do well, and it's, it can be really hard to predict why they won't. Sometimes the liver just won't, um, then patients don't do well. And in a handful of cases, I've had bad um, um, coagulation uh, problems where the hepatic veins are just clotted off. And there's one hepatoma case where that was the case, and one metastatic colon cancer where, the, where that was the case. And they came out of the blue, and there was this almost malignant um, clotting, and that's disastrous. Okay, how do they do in the long term? Well, the overall survival for these kind of patients uh, at five years is about 40%. Disease-free survival is less, so obviously about 33%. It obviously depends on the disease. So metastatic colon cancer actually does remarkably well. So the five-year survival um, after this sort of case for metastatic colon cancer is, is near 60%. Disease-free survival is less, you know, 45, 50%. But these are obviously highly selected patients um, but uh, you know the five-year survival is significant. Uh, less so for things like uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, where the, where the three-year survival is only about you know, thirty percent. Um, which points out that you know once you get over that initial drop in the curve, which is you know, around the time of surgery, everything else depends on the cancer. And really, very much biology trumps everything else. You can do what you're doing wonderful things, but in the end. Um, you know, biology is going to is going to dictate how people do. I'm going to talk about some general pointers. Um, so, in terms of the workup, so if you have a cancer that's growing up into the heart, where whatever it's starting from, you know, whether it's a sarcoma or whether it's a clangio or metastatic colon cancer or hepatoma. You know, they all have to have a thorough staging and radiological workup. They all need a CT of the abdomen and pelvis, three stage, because you're looking at the liver as much as anything else. So, you know, hepatic and arterial, sorry, arterial and venous phases. An MRI is quite useful to look at the bile ducts um, because the bile ducts can be exceptionally um, variable. And um, you know, the last thing you need is a bile duct injury sitting over a, 
you know, um, biologic or biologic or a you know artificial graft leaking. That, that's that's another terrible complication. CT chest, obviously, and uh, some visualization of the heart. Um, PET scan, PET scan. I'm not so adamant about um, because if you get everything else above it, you're you're going to encompass most things. And a biopsy. I think if you're going to do these things, almost everyone gets a biopsy um, to let you know what you're dealing with and uh, to give you the option of instituting neoadjuvant therapy. Patient needs a thorough workup, obviously, as well. I mean, you will know that better than I, because at that point you're dealing with, you know, how will this person do uh, from a heart standpoint, from a cardiac standpoint, and what will they do when they stress when I stress the heart because there's I've limited the venous return or put them on venous bypass. I'm just going to say the constitutional symptoms are bad. If you have a cancer with, you know, and the patient's got constitutional symptoms, you know, bad weight loss, bad fatigue, anorectic, you know, probably that's a patient you shouldn't be touching. Um, if you, if it's a perineoplastic, that's another issue. If they're symptomatic from, I mean, some of these sarcomas have some pretty odd perineoplastics, and if you're operating for that, that's one thing. But constitutional symptoms are bad. And neoadjuvant therapy is something that should be considered. Often, I think, uh, often because I think it's a test of time. It gives an idea of how that tumor and how the patient is going to do with time, which is a question of, you know, what's the biology of the disease and can I actually help with this wild and wonderful operation? Sarcomas, we tend to put on chemo, even though the chemo doesn't, I mean, the response rate to, to sarcomas and chemo is really pretty low, um, but it gives you time to see whether you're going to get nets popping up here, then everywhere. Radiation, uh, we tend to do. Uh, however, if you've got a large tumor and you've got a large spillover in the liver, I'd avoid it because, again, how that patient does is going to depend on how the liver does. And if you're killing the liver with the radiation, you shouldn't. Metastatic colon cancer, they almost all get chemotherapy, and I think it's a very good idea because the survival um, really is dependent on two things, the surgery and the chemo. And other th every other creature, for the most part, probably chemo is not a bad idea as well. Um, not because it makes the operation any easier, it usually doesn't, but because it gives you a time to assess how this person is going to do with time. And I think the notion that Mets are going to suddenly show up that weren't there before, well, you know, when you meet the patient, I think to a large extent, the die is cast. They either have Mets or they don't, you just don't see them or you do. In terms of the case, planning, I think, is everything. Um, good anesthesia, good crosstalk is essential. Um, your anesthetic team has to have a good experience with liver and good experience with cardiac. Um, I think you need to find people you work well with. This is not a time where you want to have people come in that you don't like and can't work with. You need a, you need a good team. When it comes to a team, you need a some way of getting people on the same page, and I think a script is something to consider. It sounds silly, but it, no, it doesn't sound silly, but it sounds self-evident, but we don't do this sort of thing enough. So I think writing a script is, can be very useful. Cable clamping, uh, despite my fellow experience, is tolerated in many patients with or without collaterals, with or without venous collaterals. If it's not, then I consider venous venous bypass first before cardiac bypass. Because again, massive doses of heparin association with liver resection are not bad. And when I started off, I had a few cases of people who died from just profuse um, bleeding, you know, at sites distance from where we were operating on um, because we were putting them on bypass and giving, you know, giving do massive doses of, of anticoagulation. Some intra-abdominal cable tumors slip out of the atrium. Some don't, like that disaster case I, I showed you earlier. So you need to plan or both, and you need to think, okay, well, if I've got everything clamped, you know, is everything going to be, and I go and bypass, is everything going to be protected, like specifically the liver, which you may have clamped off before? And I think it's worth pointing out, you know, we started off doing these cases, I just, you know what I mean, everyone, or, and um, now we don't, because a, a large portion of the atrium can actually be pulled from the abdomen if you just keep creeping up on it. Um, and you can clamp a good part of the atrium, providing you spare the coronary sinus. Um, so often a, a sternotomy is not necessary, but I think you should have a low threshold for it, especially when you're starting off with these cases because you want the best exposure possible. And that brings me to my last point, which is how do you determine what is resectable and what isn't? Because again, these are highly specialized kinds of cases. Um, 
And some people will look at this and say, well, no way. And other people will look at that and say, well, that looks you know, interesting. Um, and ideally what you want is to be able to bring people together in the same room and have them all looking at things in the same way. And this is another hobby. I think virtual reality is one way of doing this. So I'm just showing this because I think it's, it's kind of a fun video, but we, you know, we're, we and other people are developing tools where you can take the CT or the MRI and create a reconstruction model and then manipulate that in a virtual reality space and then develop these tools where you can, you know, take these planes through in a coronal axial um, sagittal way and look at the intersection of all these planes and get a really good idea of what the anatomy is like. Here's an example. This is one of our previous fellows. Um, that was a that was a big skull because it was kind of entertaining, but this is more of a, a case of irrelevant to this discussion. So this is what he is seeing on the computer screen. And um, these are kind of some of the models we're working with where you can take the CT, which is now a VR model, and you know, make it bigger, make it smaller, change the axis, rotate it around and then start manipulating field of view, sagittal, coronal, axial. You can really have a good look at you know, the intersection of all these different anatomical planes. And then you can start highlighting things. You can start highlighting the venous phase, the arterial phase, really get a good idea of how the vessels are interacting with the tumor. He's just doing this for himself. So he's in the room, he's doing it for himself, but you don't have to the neat thing about VR is you don't have to be in anywhere, really. You, you, you can be sitting in your office, you can be sitting at home, and everyone can be in the same, seeing the same thing, manipulating the same thing, and you can develop these tools where you can you know, take a pointer, for instance, and put it right on the thing you're looking at so everyone can exactly what you're looking at. So we've actually done that, you know, um, across the ocean. This is pre-COVID, obviously. You go across the ocean. So this is a fellow of mine that's sitting in my office, which is why it's so messy. Uh, another fellow sitting in Dublin, Ireland, and they're discussing the same case, which you can see on the screen behind the fellow in Ireland. They're both seeing the same thing. And my fellow currently is manipulating the model, which is a sarcoma that started in ovary and grew up into the cava and then through the heart and blocked the hepatic veins and grew up into the heart. And, um, you know, they're, they're talking about these points uh, and they can use these instruments, pick up an instrument, you know, exchange instruments so we can point out individual things, ask each other different things about it. Plan, really, you see what I mean? So they're, they're across an ocean, but they are discussing this actually in front of an audience in Dublin. But you can have as many people in the virtual world as you like, and here they are shifting models for looking for different things. So the, it's, I think it'll be a very useful way of bringing people together so that with these weird but rare cases, you can bring expertise to bear really quite quickly um, to see, to answer, you know, whether you should resect it. Because, you know, often that's really the question. Not, not can you, but should you. So just quickly some conclusions. Tales from down under. Dealing with intracardiac extension of hepatic and retrocardial tumors. So um, often you have to deal with the liver, whether you're just excluding it, whether you're resecting it. And those bring up um, combined surgical anesthesia considerations. Again, I think biology trumps everything else. You can do amazing things from surgery, but ultimately, once you get through that first curve, survival is dictated by the disease. Careful planning is absolutely critical, and I think we should all be discussing cases more often in the same place, and I think virtual reality is one way to do that. It's here, and the uh, word for COVID, it might even be more pronounced, but hopefully COVID will end, and then we can all are doing things again. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there and um, wish you all a very good day.